Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse number 99, which reads as follows. Ramaniyani aranyani yathana ramati jano vitaraga ramisanti natte kama gavesino which means those forests are delightful where there is no one no being na ramati jano no being no person who delights vitaraga ramisanti the uh, those free from passion will delight not the gama kama gavesino not those who are gone to or are seeking out gavesa not those who seek out pleasure so quite an instructive verse can okay, quite similar to our last verse if you're keeping up the last one was about delightful forests as well but that was about uh, where an arahant dwells. Anywhere an arahant dwells, that's a delightful place. So this verse actually doesn't really have a place in the arahata vaga, except that it follows after the last verse, which did talk about arahants. Of course, this one does talk about enlightened beings, and the story is about arahantship, so let's get right to the story. Here we have a story of a monk who was practicing meditation in the forest, he had found this delightful forest in which to uh, meditate. He had thought to himself, oh, here's a, uh, a place where I will certainly progress in my practice. And so he strove to his utmost in this forest, doing, I guess, doing walking and sitting meditation. But fortune had it, or bad fortune it was, that a courtesan or a prostitute um, happened to think the same thing. Boy, this forest would be a nice place to meet a client. You know, good place. So two kinds of delighting or two kinds of pleasure, two kinds of, of enjoying were, were um, well, they had the same idea, but for two different types of enjoyment. So the monk was here sitting in the forest and the, court, the prostitute or courtesan or however you want to translate it uh, was also in the forest with an appointment with one of her clients. And so she was quite near where the monk was and she was sitting in the forest patiently waiting for her client and as it turned out uh, her client didn't show up. So she was left sitting in this forest waiting for her client until finally, impatient, she realized hmm, he's certainly not going to show up. Uh, might as well just go back home. And, but on, and on her way back home, lo and behold, she spied a monk. I guess he was somewhat handsome or, or uh, at least looked like a suitable client. Not someone who might be gullible enough or might be beguiled by her ways. And so she decided in her mind, she made up, made up her mind in a very, you could say, a fairly unwholesome decision to seduce the monk. And so she went up to this monk who was sitting there valiantly striving in meditation. He wasn't enlightened, so there was hope for her. Um, and so she, she came up close to where the monk was and cleared her throat. And the monk looked up and saw her and she let her robe slip a little bit and showed a little bit of, you know, uh, just sitting as though she was just there to, to perhaps meditate or, or to enjoy the, the peace and quiet, but moving her skirts ever so slightly to show her legs and uh, shifting around and, you know, showing off her attributes. And sure enough, the monk found his concentration begin to waver. He found himself suddenly uh, rather disturbed. Uh, and, and 
not sure. It's an interesting thing that he he says. It's as though he's never felt such desire before, because his whole body begins to shake, and uh, you know maybe his sweat comes out of his armpits or his his body heats up, and he becomes confused. He doesn't know what it is. He doesn't understand what's happening to him. So he he actually says, "What is this?" King, something like King no ko idang or something. What is this? What the heck is going on? At any rate, he was he was quite disturbed, and probably in a bit of trouble. Who knows what would have happened if it weren't for our favorite uh, savior, our savior, no, the one who would always save the monks who saved the monks from themselves, the Buddha. The Buddha was watching out for him, and it's, it's again one of these cases where you might believe or you might not believe. It might be unbelievable to some people. But the Buddha had this power in his mind, the ability to uh, sense or, or, or a, a heightened awareness of reality. So the story goes that he knew what was going on. He was able to understand and and furthermore able to communicate with this monk. If you don't like that, if that sounds far-fetched and implausible, well that's fine. It's not a matter. It's it's more the, the, the meaning behind the story. But for, for most of us, this is a, there's a sense that there is more possible uh, than most of us would, are able to understand. So the, these ideas of ESP or telepathy, uh, clairvoyance, clairaudience, um, mind reading, even prediction of the future, these kind of things, there is some sense that to some extent the mind that is cultivated can engage in these things. And there's, there's accounts by the ton of meditators who claim to have these um, these powers. Now, they seem to be a bit unpredictable and certainly hard to capture by by doctors looking to prove or disprove. So there's been experiments that have been done, and if you you can learn about some of these experience the experiments that they've done in, in textbooks and often are inconclusive. I mean, it's a hard it's a hard thing to test because it takes an exceptional frame of mind, and it, exceptions are not something that science um, does best with. Of course, you know, it's the easiest to to prove or disprove something that is uh, that applies to the majority, right? Because then you can get statistically um, meaningful results. But if you're dealing with a one in a million thing, no, it's something that most people can't do. It's a little bit harder, of course. Most people just deny this the possibility outright, but then most people don't practice meditation and don't have a sense of the power of the mind. Anyway, either way, that's not the point of the story. The point is what the Buddha taught to this monk. So if you don't like the actual story, you can pretend it's a story about the Buddha being with this monk and he sees what's going on. Maybe he was meditating right beside the monk. That's not how the story goes, but you can look at it that way. It's the same meaning, because the Buddha turns to the monk and says, Aramaniyani Aranyani. It says, uh, you want to know what's going on? Why you're not happy? And it says, you can only really enjoy the forest if you're not full of lust. There's more to this verse, actually, than the story tells. But this is, this is um, when the Buddha is said to have told this verse. But there's a, more, there's a deeper meaning here. Because being alone in the forest is tough. If you go off into the forest thinking, I'm going to be free from all my problems, you learn pretty quick that all your problems come with you. And if you're not able to overcome this desire, it doesn't matter whether you're in the forest or in the, in the city. He makes the point here that uh, the work has to be done. Now, going into the forest is great. It's a great opportunity to focus your mind on the essentials. It's a great way to protect yourself from yourself. So when you get angry, when you have lust, less likely to, there's less of opportunity 
to act out on it, so it is much easier to be patient with. So you want something, well, if you know you're not going to get it, it's much easier to be mindful of, it's much easier to let it go. So, in essence, it's, um, it's, it's protecting you, you know, like, um, or, or it's a, a guard, to guard from yourself, so like training wheels on a bike. Being in the forest makes it easier, especially for new meditators, but it's never going to be comfortable. You're never going to be happy, and you're never going to become free unless you can do the work. The forest won't do the work for you. So it says, yatta naramati jano, where, where there is no one delighting. It's a play on words. The word ramati is the same root as ramaniya. Ramaniya is a, a forest that is delightful. So it's delightful when no one's delighting. So the, the, the difference is delighting in, in sensuality and delighting in freedom. And delighting is probably a bad word, but um, being happy might be the best. No. It's pleasant. Pleasant might be a good one. It's pleasant where no one seeks pleasure might be the best translation here. Um, those who are free from passion are pleased. You know, might be a good one. But the point, the point being, and the, 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 the key to this verse is this idea of what can truly please or what can truly make you happy. That's the key here. And it's the key to solving this monk's problem you know, because his mind, uh, assumedly, is inclining to find pleasure with this courtesan and this prostitute. It's inclining towards the pleasure of a body that is attractive, attractive probably because, or under, we understand because of the mind's inclination or the mind's um, recognition of it as an object of pleasure. So we find pleasurable stimulation from um, either the same gender or the opposite gender, depending on our sexual preference. But we find, we find it just in, in vision because of lifetime after lifetime, or scientists would say because of our biology, which uh, is programmed to recognize the object as an object of pleasure, a place that is to be uh, enjoyed. So it leads to physical pleasure, it leads to uh, sounds, pleasant sounds, sounds of love and and of enjoyment and laughter and so on, all of these pleasant sounds that we so enjoy, pleasant sights, pleasant sounds, pleasant smells. And so as a result, as soon as you see the, someone and you say, that's a woman, the sign of the woman for a man in, inflames the mind. So this is the, where, where his mind was inclined towards. But he realized something, it seems, um, not only was he, he caught up in it, but he realized that it was actually disturbing him. He said, what's going on? What, what's the meaning of this? And the Buddha straightens out the meaning by saying that actually, or points out that, hey, look what's going on with you. you know, look, what the, look where this is leading. And it's, a, it's another useful thing about the forest is that you get to a different state of calm, a different state of peace. So you have pleasure in a sense that is you could say wholesome. It's the pleasure of peace, the pleasure of a calm state. Now I think you could still argue that it would lead to attachment because you can get attached to calm and peaceful states. But um, there are aspects of it that are wholesome where the mind is calm and, and undisturbed, where the mind is fixed and focused. So actually considered to be wholesome, useful. And that's in, and in contrast with trying to find pleasure in in lust, in the sensu in, in sensuality, because all all the chemicals that are involved, all the hormones that are involved, are actually quite disturbing, and they inflame the mind, and they lead to jealousy and uh, irritation, they lead to uh, frustration, they lead eventually to a lot of anger states unpleasant states. And so he was seeing, in a sense, the unpleasantness of it. It's really the key 
to this problem of sensuality, this problem of desire. It's the, the fact, the simple fact, that it's essential for us to learn that these things can't satisfy us, that they don't satisfy us, that they don't make us happy. You can take them, and it's, the, it's the, the crux of the problem, really. It's like, does it, the answer to this question, why am I not happy? I'm indulging, I'm enjoying, I'm, I'm engaging, I have everything anyone could want. Why am I not happy? And some people I don't think ever come to that even. They don't ever realize that they're not happy. I've had this argument with people before where they, where they say, well, what's, are we, we get this question a lot actually. What's wrong with sensual pleasures if it makes you happy? Well, if it really made you happy, there'd be nothing wrong with it. The problem is that it doesn't. And it's funny that often we don't even realize that. Those of us who do are the ones inclined towards spirituality. And we would say that's a better thing to be displeased by these things. You know? Because it also answers the question as to why we, or, or answers a, a more, more mundane question of how to deal with loss, how to deal with depression, how to deal with really the results of the intense attachment to craving that we have. People who feel low self-esteem because they can't get a, uh, a romantic partner, you know, who feel like they're ugly, like they're unattractive because of an intense attachment to the just the idea of having uh, sensual or romantic relations. You know? People who get sick or who get overweight because of their attachment to food. Um, people who become depressed when, when things don't go their way or, or even get depressed when things do. You know? Who become addict, people who become addicts, addicted to drugs, addicted to all sorts of things, addicted to entertainment, and um, just never see it, you know? never get a sense that something's wrong. No, but, uh, but eventually have to deal with it. You know? So it's an, it's an answer to the question of the, the eventual loss when someone passes away, someone you love dies. It's excruciating loss. And, and we've, we're so blind, really, in general, that it's confusing to us. No, it's, it's not even confusing to us. It's, it's as though that's an, a normal part of life. It's become normal to, to feel, to mourn when you lose something, as though it was normal to cling, and as though this is the best we can expect. So we get so caught up in our attachments, so lost in our attachments, that we don't even think to free ourselves from our attachments. Instead, we want something that frees us from the suffering. And the problem is that that one leads to the other. You know, when you lose someone you love, well, the real problem was that when you say you love them, you're actually saying you're attached to them. Because love isn't something that makes you suffer. Love is, is the intention to help others. It's the friendliness that we have. It's the desire for their welfare. You know? It has nothing to do with loss. Loss and, and suffering caused by loss is because of possessiveness. The idea that it was ours, it was mine. Hmm? So it has to do with ego and it has to do with attachment. But that's a very far removed state. It's, it, if, at that, if you get to that point, which most of us do, it means we're already very much lost in the attachment. What we're talking about in this verse is uh, the fight to not have the attachment in the first place and the observation that it's so much more primal or primary when you first want something, you know, when you first like and attach to something, most of us don't see this. Most of us are lost, get all, get, have to get it later on when we lose something that we love or when something goes wrong, when we can't get what we want. Hmm? But the truth is that 
compared what this monk was seeing, and the reason he was seeing it was because he was meditating, is that compared to the peace of not wanting, wanting is something that inflames the mind. So one who seeks out kama, kama seeks out sensuality, will never be pleased, will never be um, happy. Not te ramisanti. Not those who, those who are kama govesina. Not those who seek out kama, seek out sensuality. They will not be at peace, not in the forest, or well, they won't be at peace anywhere. But the key is that uh, you see it when you have something better, when you have something better to compare it to. If you don't have something better to compare it to, you often think this is as good as it gets, this is the best I can expect, is this unsatisfying, fleeting moments of pleasure that punctuate our lives of uh, toil and strife where we have to work long hours or we have to work meaningless you know, we have to work in the world we have to do things spend our time just for these fleeting moments of pleasure and so the key here is to see that there is something better and to see that it's not all that, it's not as good as it gets. It's not the best. It's not true pleasure. It's not true happiness. And the true happiness is beyond that. It's only for those who give it up. This is the, the, the claim, and this is the core of this verse, the core of the Buddha's teaching, really. It's that happiness is to be gotten through letting go. It's a claim that is backed by meditation, but it's the argument that we give as to why people should practice meditation. You know, are you satisfied with your life? No. Yeah. There is a way to go beyond this. If you can see how unsatisfying these things are, there is a path, there is a practice that gets you past them, gets you beyond them. It's very simple. It's not religious or it's not about believing in magical powers like the Buddha could read people's minds or project an image of himself across the across space. It's not about that. It's about um, seeing the limitation of sensuality and the ultimate unsatisfactory nature of sensual pleasures, which are, rather than satisfying, they're addictive and they lead to greater and greater states of want and need until eventually the want and the need comes crashing down, can't be fulfilled, and leads to suffering. And in fact, in and of itself is a disturbance. So this is what you really see in meditation. And so you see it at a very primal level, that even any kind of touching, the Buddha compared it to, to feces. So if you, you wouldn't even want to touch it. It's not you can say, oh, it's only a little bit of feces, so that's okay. The smallest bit of feces is not worth touching. In the same way, even just the li even just the the mere seeing of something, or the mere reacting to something that you see, rather, seeing this beautiful woman, and then reacting to her, the reaction in and of itself, even before he, we decide whether he can get it or not get it, not having it. This is what leads us to want to get, is because not having it is suffering. Here he's, his body is shaking in what we would call anticipation, but it's actually in withdrawal, because you know, he doesn't have it yet. He, it, the, the body is saying, get that, get that, get that. Yeah. And that's what leads to suffering. That's what is suffering, really, the not having. And so then you would chase after and get it, and then you'd suffer. I mean, you'd have to disrobe from being a monk, He'd have to you know, get involved with many different things. But most importantly, he'd chase after it, get it, get the pleasure, and then suffer when he didn't have it again, wanting it. So this relates This is relates directly to our meditation. This is Here we have a story of a meditator who had to deal with this. So the story goes that he was able to listen, to hear what the Buddha was saying, 
And he was able to get what the Buddha was saying, and he was able to meditate. You know, as I've talked about meditating on the, f the, the aspects of desire, the aspects of attachment. So there is the desire, that's a part of it, but there's much more involved. There's the physical sensations, this heat in the body or the tension in the body or, or whatever physical aspects there are. Then there's the pleasure, which is fleeting, but it's there. When you want something, there's often a pleasure associated with it. Oh good, I'm going to get that. The sort of excitement will be there. Then there's the image, the image itself that you see. You see this, this beautiful woman, beautiful man, beautiful thing, you know, beautiful food, whatever it is. Uh, that's another part of it. And, and they work in a sequence. So you'll see the food, it gives you pleasure, you want it, you chase, you give, give rise to an intention, wanting, chasing, getting, and then the cycle continues. So if you cut it off at any place, you catch all of these, break it into its parts, and catch what is really happening in that moment. And then that's all it is. Because the um, enjoyment is not any one of those things. The cycle itself is not any one of those things. So when you focus only on one of them, you've broken the illusion. You've broken the uh, delusion. You've pierced this, this misconception of attractiveness. Now, there's nothing attractive about any one of the things. Now, you see something, it's just light. There's nothing attractive there. You recognize it. You want it. Each one of those things is just an individual state. That's what we do in meditation. So we remind ourselves, this is seeing, seeing, this is feeling, feeling, this is wanting, wanting, thinking, thinking, and so on, liking, liking. And if you do that, if you go back and forth between each and one of these things, you can overcome any addiction. You really can. Again, it's just about doing the work. It's not about living in the forest. <laughs> Obviously, that doesn't work all the time. Even if there's not women coming up to meet, up to seduce you, yeah, which does happen, but even if there's not, uh, no matter what, there's only one who, only a person who can uh, vita, vita raga, who can free themselves from passion, give up the passions in the mind. Only they will be happy. Doesn't and actually, this verse doesn't say it, but it doesn't matter in the forest or anywhere. It's not where. It's not about being in the forest. Although there is something, the verse is also saying that the forest is actually harder to be in. And there's no way anyone who is stuck on, on sensuality could be happy in the forest because there's nothing very sensual in the forest. There's no bright lights or pretty colors or beautiful, attractive uh, human beings or food or, or this or that. It's actually quite hard living in the forest, as we talked about in the last verse. But... It's delightful for those who are free from sensuality. Why? Because it's peaceful. Because you don't have people coming to bother you. Because you are able to keep your mind um, at ease, at peace. Anyway, that's the Dhammapada for tonight. So quite a useful message for all of us. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. Wish you all good practice. Be well.